Felipe, welcome to the BBR podcast. <laughs> How are you doing today? Good, good. Thanks for having me, David. I appreciate the, uh, the invitation and I'm excited to share my experiences and hopefully uh, shine some insight into uh, the dating world a little bit. Yeah, I think, I think we could talk for months and months and months about that, that exact topic. But uh, you and I met on Facebook through the Man Talks uh, private group. Uh, what's been your experience uh, following Connor Beaton and the Man Talks community? I think it's been great. I mean, you have uh, a wide array of, uh, of guys that are, you know, dealing with issues from marriage to uh, depression, all the way to people that are really, really uh, have done a lot of work on themselves and have a lot to share as well. Um, so it's been great to connect with every, every, every person from all that spectrum, all the way to, I remember connecting with a guy that was, um, what was it, deaf? and had some issues with dating and that kind of stuff so that was very unique to connect with uh, with him but uh, but i've been loving it yeah i think it's a great community really positive uh, energy behind that yeah i totally agree um i had been listening to connor's man talks podcast for quite a while and the first episode i listened to was with brian reeves who's a canadian um lmft i believe but um i had to pull over i was ugly crying in the car <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah, you know, I actually, I vote, I'm only part of the group. I've never actually listened to the podcast, but, uh, but yeah. That's one I would highly recommend starting with. Um, yeah. Ryan and Connor were talking about the, the levels of intimacy. Okay. And I always raced through level one intimacy, and I wanted to get to level two, like, so quick. You know, level one is a honeymoon phase, and it's really the Eros love period of time and then level two is that security and i want that that blanket statement of exclusivity and right and that, that's something i wanted to kind of work on a lot is just kind of slowing down and pacing myself and really enjoying the process is is that something that you help your clients do through social buddha absolutely actually that's one of the the main things it's about uh more than anything yeah getting to know yourself uh getting to know what you want and from there, how do you powerfully, and by powerfully, I mean naturally, progress from being in a dating uh, you know, scenario and really um, you know, not be too, too attached to an ideal, basically. That's really what it is. And figuring out what story is that's going on in your head when you rush into it. Are you already thinking of being in, I don't know, in Italy with this person? Are you thinking that kind of stuff? This is stuff I had to think about when I would get from women like, oh, you're being needy. Oh, you're being like this and that kind of stuff. Or you're going too fast in that way. Um, I had to really figure out what was going on in my head and why I was acting that way. And so I figured that, you know, at least for us guys and maybe women as well, from what I hear from every, everyone that I coach um, in terms of women, uh, is that we um, tend to act like we're in a relationship before we're in one. And so we start, um, you know, texting all the time and that kind of stuff, over communicating. We start going into, you know, what's, what's this about? Where's this going? And that kind of stuff. But honestly, one of the biggest thing is over communication. Uh, and um, I really believe that your communi communication should be held or when you're there in person, especially in the beginning. You're not in a freaking relationship. You're dating still. You're doing that kind of stuff. So stop over communicating. It's going to eliminate the mystery. It's going to eliminate the intrigue. And the other person's not going to want to, uh, they know everything about you. So why would they want to meet up? In fact, that is one of the biggest causes for flaking over communication. And honestly, I've struggled with other things, but this has been something that I have, you know, really cemented down from almost from the very beginning to not over communicate. Rarely have I ever gone flaked on because of the fact that I keep things till we meet in person, basically. Yeah, I love that, that mystique or the mysteriousness of meeting somebody new like the first date is not for that um that verbal dumping or verbal vomiting of yeah. all of our all of our stuff on that first date so 
I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown and she talks about oversharing, but you're talking a little bit more about like over communicating, maybe texting every morning that wake up, good morning, beautiful text. And yeah, uh, and that's a question that I asked our community one day is like, how, when do you send that first good morning text? And to your point, maybe you were making that you don't send that text even before you meet up if you met on a dating app or if you met through friends or through a fix up. Is that right? That's, that's right. I mean, unless we're, you know, in a more, um, you know, I guess serious dating and we're beginning to really um, explore that possibility and, and it's going there and it's mutual. And again, that comes from experience. You can feel the energy where it's at and so forth. Uh, you have to really learn how to read energy because um, in this way, because of the fact, and, and the way you do it is you deal with your issues. You want to figure out what those issues are, what your past conditioning is, so that th that noise doesn't get in, in front of you when you are actually reading what's going on uh, with the other person. But in regards to the morning text, I would say, you know, you want to, especially if it's someone that you're really interested in, when you're, you know, when you are, you know, maybe dating someone that you're not sure about, it's not difficult to not over communicate. <laughs> That's, it's, it, you're not going to over communicate because you're kind of still like, mm, I'm on the fence about it. And they go really well. Why? Because you're not attached. Second of all, you want to, so you want to, you want to get to that point and that mindset um, when you are meeting someone that you're interested in. How do you do it? You want to really um, take a breather. You want to, again, figure out what's going on in your head, perhaps. Before you even start dating, you figure out what happened in the past, the past time that you uh, put someone off or that kind of stuff and go through the story that you told yourself so that you can begin to be aware of those thoughts and begin to let them dissolve, let them go. And from there, um, you really, if it's someone that you're really interested in, you take a little bit the lead from them as far as how they want to they play the, the uh, courtship, if you will. Mm hmm yeah, but, courtship, yeah. You know, courtship is something really important to keep in mind that that it's an enjoyable process and it's definitely um, when you flourish in a reflection of the other person, then right. that's how it feels natural and that's how it feels authentic. But I, I kind of gather that you're talking about overthinking it a little bit, leading to over communication. So like you're playing out these scenarios in your head and then all of a sudden, they flake on you or it blows up in your face or, <laughs> you know, is this a commonality that you're finding with people um, that you're talking to about dating? Yes. Um, and there's a lot of flaking, actually. There's a lot of the whole thing about ghosting. Um, I don't really, from my experience, I don't really get it because when you are only paying attention to the people that are paying attention to you, you what I mean by that is, so, for example, um, you well, here's the, here's the biggest thing, really. Um, you have to have your mindset together and your energy together in regards to br not bringing out those behaviors in people, first of all. You're not expecting that and you're not, you know, I hope this doesn't happen again or I hope this guy or this woman doesn't flake on me or I hope I don't put him off. I hope this text that I send them doesn't put them off because it's something that's so common. We worry so much about that text or did I say the right things, et cetera. Second thing, do you have the right habits, habits established? So part of those habits, again, especially in the beginning, when you're just meeting someone and you're getting to know them, maybe first, second, third date type of thing is, are you leaving these, you know, communication to where you're in, where you're actually meeting them in person, those type of habits, as well as, um, you know, um, yeah, I would say some of those things would be important. Yeah. Yeah. Attached to the outcome is, uh, is a habit that um, I'd mm -hmm. recommend for a lot of people to actually like totally get over because having expectations and an attachment to the outcome of say like a first date really kind of gets us into um, that trouble area. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, um, it's, it's interesting, the whole attachment to the outcome, it can be uh, misleading in terms of how to solve it, and how to really get over it. But, uh, but it's definitely one of the biggest ways to screw up anything. Um, it is going to not only either make you walk on eggshells, 
or it's going to make you very neurotic. And also your energy is going to be totally off when it comes to, because I really do believe in this, by the way. I believe that, um, and this is from my experience with coaching clients as well. I believe that it, your energy speaks louder than your freaking words. It's way beyond body language. It's beyond, you know, what's it called? Um, beyond even in person. I really believe that. And so when you are attached to the outcome, like it is the end all, that's going to definitely limit you. And so when it comes to that, again, you have to figure out what you're attached to and why you're attached to it. It might be that you're attached to um, some kind of validation. I'm sure other guests in your podcast have shared this. Maybe when you were little, your parents at one point were not uh, giving you love. You felt that you were, you know, love was withdrawn from you. Whatever it is that you're searching for, whether it's validation through sex, whether it's um, simply being liked by people or not being rejected or excluded, figure out where it comes from and really keep, um, keep an eye out on what story you're telling yourself in regards to how your life is going to be fabulous and how you're going to be just this incredible person and you, all your problems are going to be solved because of this person that you just met. Yeah, you're attaching validation from other, uh, from somebody else giving you worth. So if we're aware of our bad habits or our bad um, stories that we're telling ourselves, that can take away from our own self-worth and prevent us from actually having validation coming from within instead of an external source. Absolutely. And honestly, I believe validation, self-esteem is almost like uh, and confidence too, but more importantly, self-esteem and, and value in yourself. I, I believe, you know, it's, it can, you know, especially when you deal with your, your past, when you deal with your past issues, it can be something that's like a muscle that you can actually train, um, you know, by developing a powerful daily routine. Um, and that routine uh, would involve bringing awareness about yourself through meditation, for example. Uh, it would mean letting go of past issues um, through maybe what I use personally to let go of emotions is the uh, Sedona method. Very simple method. I've been using it for years. Um, and then also recreating, and this is what I really, um, one of the biggest things that I teach my clients is recreating your script. And that freaking script is incredibly powerful because literally it's almost like magic. So you have something going on in your head when you go on the first date or when you are going to send that text or when you are uh, behind social media, whatever the heck it is that is going on in your head is actually what's bringing out those results for better or for worse. So literally as a guy or as a woman, you can have this crazy story that Every time you walk in the street, super hot men or super hot women come up to you and ask, your, ask for your phone number, do all this kind of stuff, and it will literally happen every freaking day. Or you attract this kind of person or very specific. So the biggest thing really when it comes to that is shifting your script to something that's empowering and to, and to realize also how much freaking power you have, how much responsibility you have over your life, over yourself, and that it's not just freaking what you say. It, it's actually what are you saying to yourself, your relationship with yourself? What are you saying about men or about women, depending on who you're dating? All those relationships, all those stories, all those scripts, get them out into a piece of paper and then reframe them into a powerful story and do not, and, it, and again, this is, I get resistance from my clients, but then when they see the freaking results, they're like, oh my God, I should have done this before. But do not be humble in your script because the biggest thing is that we've been, you know, trained to, uh, in this negative self-talk for such a long time. And we take it as the truth to be able to overcome that kind of stuff. You need to really shoot for the fence when it comes to your script about what's possible for you. Yeah, got it. Absolutely. Yeah. I think of it as like our thoughts become our beliefs, our beliefs yeah. become our actions and our actions become our results. You know, like yeah. that's a self-fulfilling prophecy that we can apply to business, family, mm -hmm. love, spirituality, 
And the more we're wishing it and willing it and meditating on it or journaling on it, which is a skill that I use. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The more I can manifest that ideal lasting love that I'm looking for. It, it's, it's, a, it's a muscle. It's really, uh, you become better at it. Um, also, um, you can become more specific about it to, be, to bring more specific um, creation, if you will. And, uh, and everything, your life becomes easier because literally there's a lot of steps that you think you need to take, like texting this person a hundred times a day so you don't lose them. Yeah. Um, steps like, and I'm not saying not to be social, but even as a guy, I, I guarantee you that most guys think that they always have to be approaching, which is fine. It's great. I think it's socializing is fantastic. But there are so many different realities out there that you can actually create and that you will live day by day if you take a leap of faith. And, and, and that's what I'm talking about. And you begin to, again, build that muscle of creation and, uh, and of really, um, well, transforming yourself, really. Yeah, take a chance when you feel that it's, uh, it's out there. You know, um, you walk into a room and you've got a certain type of energy and that energy is gravitating to a person with similar energy in that room. And it's almost like uh, the tunnel vision or the light gets shined on the person with the same kind of energy that you have. Yeah. And if you feel yeah. it and if you see it um, subconsciously or intuitively, freaking take a chance, go up, <laughs> walk up to that person and just say hello and introduce yourself. And without the intention or the, attachment to the outcome of like, oh, well, I'm attracted to that person. I'm going to get their number. Okay, yeah. attracted to that person. I'm going to have a conversation with that person. Yep. And that's it. I, I agree. And, and to expand more on that, I think it's, it's a great point. Um, I also believe that your energy shows up before you even arrive. So whatever crazy story in a positive way, you're telling yourself before you get to that event or that social, you know, for example, as a, as a guy, the guy, guy's perspective, women are going to be all over me. People are going to be just a great time. And I'm going to be inspiring people to be social and doing, you know, just being connecting everyone to each other. And women are going to be asking for my phone number. Whatever crazy story you tell yourself prior to arriving to that event, it's already there before you even get there. So you're just showing up for it to manifest. It's like they, your energy is like your ambassador. It shows up before you get there. Once you get there, everything happens. You do the right things because that's what you told yourself. You're coming in from a frame of abundance. You're coming in from a frame of non-neediness and you're coming in from a frame of giving. Mm -hmm. that, that abundant mindset is something that I've received after practicing and training that muscle of my brain and my intuition and my heart through journaling. Yeah. So what happened personally I don't, I don't share my personal life much on the podcast, but sure. I was journaling regularly morning and night and I was starting to get the story out on paper with humility and um, with building the confidence while I was doing it. And I started to see um, patterns and tendencies and I'm like, all right, I'm focusing so much and I'm training this muscle so much right now and I'm not getting results romantically. Yeah. I'm going to take a break. And yeah. so I decided to take a break. I deleted all dating apps, which was not all that successful for me anyways. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I hit the reset button mm -hmm. and I began to, again, focus entirely inward and prioritize myself to rebuild my self-worth and my confidence. And, and I went into a social situation without expectations <laughs> And it was almost as if like, as soon as I wasn't looking for it, that's when it found me. Yeah. And the social situation, I walk in and my energy is clean and mm -hmm. it's clear and there are no ill intents whatsoever. Yeah. And that's the energy I brought. And it just kind of like blossomed and exploded without all that much effort. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, you did the work on yourself. That was that's huge. And speaking of um, clean energy and that type of stuff as well, it's it's also 
it's also about being congruent. And, uh, and I don't mean just in terms of, first of all, yeah, figure out what you want. And whatever it is that you want, that's up to you. You dictate your own values. You dictate your whatever it is that is right for you. Other than that, when I mean congruency, um, I mean, I was thinking about what to talk about in terms of authenticity. And, and yeah, I mean, the first thing that pops into mind is figure out who you are, what you're about. But also, when you figure out who you are, make sure you're congruent with all your belief systems. What that means is if there is something that's pulling you here and another thing that's pulling you this way, whether it's belief systems, whether it's values, uh, values that are no longer useful that you, you gain from your parents or that you gain from society or that you gain from that one time you got your heart broken or whatever it is, if they are pulling you, for example, if it's something like a fear value that's pulling you to safety or that kind of stuff or a belief system that's contradicting what you think you want right now, again, and you're not aware of this stuff, when you do become congruent and align all these belief systems together, everything becomes effortless because there's no resistance to what it is that you're saying that you want. And so if, for example, um, you know, you have a, a belief system that says um, women shouldn't approach guys or that kind of stuff, it, or it, you know, you have a judgment about it, it's probably not going to happen for you. As well as if you have a belief system that tells you that you're not worthy of something, if it tell, like one of the most common belief systems that we're not worthy of, you know, X amount of money, that we're not worthy of travel, that we're not worthy of freedom, that we're not worthy of love, that we're not worthy of X, Y, Z, man or woman. Uh, that is what I mean by congruency, that everything is aligned, your relationship with yourself, relationship with uh, the opposite sex or whoever you're dating, um, and that also all your values are aligned uh, to empower you in what it is that you've chosen to create in your life. Yeah, 100% on board with that. Um, on the flip side of the abundant mindset, people can get stuck in telling them, themselves the story of scarcity of like, oh, there are no good guys left in Denver. Um, there's a Peter Pan syndrome where no guy wants to grow up in Denver. Well, if you keep telling yourself that story, then of course, through self-fulfilling prophecy and through your energy, like that's gonna be what exists for you because that's the mindset that you're creating. <laughs> so how do we bust out of a scarcity mindset other than like journaling and meditation and retraining that brain? What's, a, what's like a tipping point to get from scarcity to abundance in the dating world? Um, honestly, I, I believe, uh, I mean, you mentioned other than journaling, other than the other stuff, it, it really is, um, not to go back into that, but it really is, where does that scarcity belief come from? Like, did, is it because you've been freaking heartbroken the last three, four, five times? Or because, you know, I've had a client that uh, she told me that, um, you know, at one point in high school, she was told that she, by this guy, which is horrible, by the way, what, what happened, but that she was like Hawaii, that everyone wanted to go there, but nobody wanted to live there. Mm. Where do these freaking scarcity beliefs come from? Like, so it's not just, you know, in regards to scarcity, it's like, why do you feel unworthy of this? Also, why have you trained yourself or conditioned yourself or what happened that conditioned you to believe that? Um, because it's not only about scarcity, but it's also about what you bring out out of people. So, um, for example, if you have a certain belief about how people in Denver are, or how the men in, in Denver are, not only you, you probably won't meet the guys that you want, but even the guys that you meet that might fit that mold that you think you want, you'll bring out the worst in them. You will dictate, you almost like a freaking sign that you have with your energy, you will tell them how to treat you. Mm -hmm. with your energy yeah and and i've i've had um i mean a ton of calls with people that are not aware of what they're projecting people tell me i'm closed off people tell me i'm kind of a bitch people tell me this and then the other i don't see it okay <laughs> that's the thing though that that's why that introspection introspection and the um really like you said journaling and all that kind of stuff I mean, I mean, I even go as far as, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in um, dreams and journaling about dreams and beginning to use dreams actually to, um, to impact your subconscious. 
directly. So there's a lot of stuff that we're not aware of. And I think that is one of the most powerful tools in transformation awareness. And so in this way, when we are like saying, all oh, right, this kind of woman or this kind of man uh, are not here and I always get the worst and blah, blah. Again, not only are you only meeting the worst, but you are only bringing out the worst, even in some guys that might be good guys. Yeah, I can, I can picture myself at one point in my life, maybe just about a year ago, the story that I was telling you before, <laughs> yeah, yeah. before we jumped on and hit record, but really just telling you why the podcast started in the first place. And my energy was attracting the wrong kind of energy. And that introspection and that self-awareness, it's not like, yes, it's like a light switch where you, you're in a dark room and you're fumbling for your keys and you flip on the lights and then all of a sudden you get to see everything. It's kind of like that, but when you flip on the light switch, you can't see everything in the room yet. Right. Right. The only thing you see in front of you is your car keys that you were looking for in the dark. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah. And then the longer that the lights are on, the more we get to see, oh, I see that lamp. Oh, I yep. see that love seat where there's actually two seats, but my, I sit on one side of the couch and there's an ass groove there, but the other side of the couch is perfectly formed because I haven't had a partner in a year. Right, right. <laughs> no, I mean, that's... On the analogy, but... <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's true though. I mean, and then sometimes the light switches turn off, so you have to turn them back on until they stay on. Uh, you got to train your brain because again, you're conditioned to manifest certain things, you're conditioned to have certain habits, you're conditioned to just be a certain kind of person that, uh, that projects that. And, and it's tough. I mean, it's tough to, it's tough to really, especially in the beginning, if you are, is this, if this is the beginning for you in terms of uh, personal development, but it's tough to swallow the pill of I'm responsible for a lot. And even when, for example, me as a coach, um, could tell a friend, for example, um, it's, it's great news. You have the power now. You, you can create incredible things. Every, oh, so you're saying that I'm to blame for all this crap? Okay, that's not, you know, so it's a tough pill to swallow, but once you accept things as that and taking responsibility, one of the most powerful things you can do, then you can begin to create things. And, uh, and in, in my personal story, one of the biggest things that I used to do or project or manifest, I would always be the friend, uh, always the friend. And I was like, holy shit, why am I too nice? Mr. Nice uh, guy. <laughs> yeah, I was Mr. Nice guy for years and years since high school. And then I would turn like, oh, I'm going to be a bad boy. It was like technique wise. It, it was all over the place, but it was always the nice guy. And it had to do with self-worth. Again, it's not even a, it's like, well, how come I can't meet girls that, I'm, that are attracted to me? It's not even only about abundance and scarcity. It's the fact that I don't believe I'm worthy of it. That I'm not worthy of a, of a woman being like, oh, damn, that guy's hot. <laughs> I, I had that belief system. So over and over and over and over. So I wouldn't even, I wouldn't, um, you know, initiate a physical connection. Uh, I was timid. But also, even though I was social, I was like, what the and I've had clients like that, by the way, especially uh, male clients um, that either won't make a move or that always get friend zoned, uh, even though they have some incredible social lives and have everything going for them, monetary, uh, travel wise, everything. But it's the fact that are you seeing yourself as a sexy person? Are you seeing yourself as worthy of a specific type of woman or a specific, a specific type of guy that you're looking for. But yeah, I would always get friend zone and, uh, and I couldn't figure out why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So earlier in our conversation, we were talking about hiding behind social media <laughs> and what kind of an impact positive or negative does social media have in our romantic relationships? Um, <laughs> I don't believe it's positive unless you're using it to host an event or to do some kind of connecting people with each other or actually delivering value over social media like you do. Um, but I, or for example, how we met, like we yeah. would not have met without social media and Facebook being used in an appropriate way in a positive way. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, but I think for the most part, especially when it comes to intimacy and, and this part in this area that we're talking about, um, 
it is, I think it's negative because we, um, it lends itself to an even bigger opportunity to create this fantasy <laughs> of how people are. I mean, it, it's crazy. I mean, I, in my teenage years, you know, when before Facebook and everything, you started chatting. And so you would make up this crazy story of this person that was across the world from you. And it's still the same. People hide behind it because they don't want to get hurt or because they feel that their current experience of men in Denver or that kind of stuff are horrible and all that kind of stuff. Also, it gives you a safety net in regards to your story of fantasy of how a man or a woman should be. And it makes it easier to create it because you don't actually have to experience the real thing for the ugliness that it can be in your reality. Yeah, it is a highlight reel of what we're posting um, on social media. Um, I'm guilty of it. I know people close to me are guilty of it. And I'm thought I, I'm transplanted back to Teddy Roosevelt said that the comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. And if we're comparing ourselves to others on social media, Facebook, Instagram, even on a dating app, mm -hmm. it takes all the joy out of life. And that's why we've chosen to take as a group uh, these mini social media detoxes every weekend for the past, shoot, this is weekend number nine for me in a row. Oh, nice, man. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. For Friday morning at 8 a.m. through Monday morning at 8, um, I, I delete Instagram and Facebook and I'm not yeah. much on Twitter. I'm not nice. much on LinkedIn other than like checking a message or two, but, um, but it's been a great practice for me to become more present with family and friends and nice. I'm actually reaching out to people via text. Uh, hey, how are you? I, uh, before I deleted my app on Thursday, I saw that you were sick. Um, did your fever break or whatever, you know, yeah. and I actually texted that instead of, um, DM'd after I saw an Instagram yeah. story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. I, I like that. And honestly, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, um, you know, there, yeah. We, I mean, it's, everyone knows this. We're put on our, our, our best, um, foot forward, if you will. But um, one of the things that I'm, I have a lot of respect for a lot of the coaches out there, and they've inspired me, actually. Um, every single week, I post a vulnerability post where I actually share what's going on in my life that's like, hey, it could be better. <laughs> or that's like, hey, I have these bad habits or whatever it is. So in that way, I've used it to, to be okay with my issues that I still have currently, like with, you know, nobody's perfect type of thing. And um, and I've seen, I mean, some of these coaches that I've met and I collaborate with that are just, you know, at least within their networks, I don't know how far it goes, but they're creating some, you know, a movement of vulnerability, kind of like Brenna Brown type of thing. But it takes, uh, you know, it does take a lot of balls, to be honest, to do that. And it's the first time I did it, I was like, I was, it was before boarding a plane. I'm like, all right, I'm post. And you know, I do definitely take those detox, but I think also I like the idea of, again, not to say that you have to share personal stuff or your family stuff, but when it comes to, especially in the platform that you and I are in, um, I think it's worth sharing that we're not perfect, that we still fuck up in dating, that we still mess up in this and then the other, that, you know, it's not always perfect for us. In fact, we struggle as well, but we are perhaps experienced different things that could help. Otherwise, though, I really believe that there is, especially if you, um, if you are in the area of, of really inspiring people and helping people out, I think it's, it's essential that you are authentic, as you would say, and vulnerable in regards to what you're dealing with. And, you know, um, whether that, you know, goes to any specific result that you might be attached to or whatever, it doesn't really matter because you know, you're doing it for, for yourself and for others that might be in that situation right now. And are like, wow, I really admire this person. And, and, and he's doing this, he's traveling all over the world, but he has these issues. Not only can I relate, but I, I feel, I feel more okay about myself. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I that's think, what I have to say I, about it. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And, and I can think of, of a post that I had made over a year ago. Um, mm. maybe right around a year ago, you know, um, oftentimes I'd be alone in the gym and the studio before I closed it down last month. And 
I would film my power clean or my snatch or this complex exercise because I don't have a coach with me, you know? Sure, sure. This is how I gain feedback on my form. And right. okay, why did I not reach that weight on a particular Olympic lift? So, right. so I take a video and I just kept mess, missing, missing the rep. I couldn't lift this weight that I was so comfortable at lifting maybe two weeks before or, or the month before or maybe even the week before. And in my Dave Glazer brand of Instagram <laughs> or that yeah. Instagram page, um, I share videos of of my exercise of jujitsu and of working out and things like that, because um, that's how I can help impact others, you know, sure. benefit of fitness and nutrition through mental health for mental health, excuse me, is that mission and that message. And actually I posted the video of me missing the rep over and over and over again. And without intention of being vulnerable, quote unquote, sure. I talked about failure. Mm. And although I did not make that rep at that weight that day, I'm still failing forward because I'm getting closer and closer to my goal every single time that I make a mistake or that I, uh, like, I'm not calling it failure, but every time that I yeah. failed at that rep, I was becoming closer and closer to my goal, which is to develop power and yep. strength. My mm -hmm. goal is never intended at the beginning of a workout session to lift that X amount of weight. Yeah. Process the is, right? Yeah. The goal is to develop more power and strength for my sport of jujitsu. That's it. Yeah. Oh, I, I can fail at that rep three or four or six times and still reach my goal. Yep. Cause and you're, you're process oriented, right? You're, you're not focused on specific, uh, I don't know, end result or specific destination. You're just focused on the process. Yeah. Yeah. It's not quantitative. It's qualitative during that mm -hmm. process. And right. why I bring it up is because I got a message without asking for it. You know, like, Dave, Perfect. I just really wanted to say thank you for posting about failure in the way that you did because it really resonated with me. And I'm like, oh, wow. I mean, somebody is always paying attention. You don't know who that person is until they actually eventually reach out and say, thank you for sharing your story. It's so real and it's so raw it really helped me out of a dark place or it helped me get to the next level of my life. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, look at what happened with um, Brené Brown when she, when she did her speech, she thought she totally fucked it up. She went home, she felt horrible. And it, it really became a movement in terms of making, you know, a lot of people okay with being more vulnerable and, and, and really um, not being perfect. Really, that's what it is. Yeah, the video that went viral, she talked about it in her Netflix special. Yeah, you saw it, huh? Which I loved. And coming back to social media and tying in Brene Brown, too, her quote in that, in that Netflix special, I recommend it for everybody. It's amazing. Yeah. It's really good. Vulnerability without boundaries is not vulnerability at all. Mm. And when we're posting on social media about vulnerability, we still need to focus on what boundaries I have for myself and what boundaries my audience has as well. Yep. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And that was a big takeaway for me from her Netflix special, um, a call to courage. I believe is what it's called. I think so. Yeah. I, I can't remember the name, but yeah, incredible on Netflix uh, video for sure. Yeah. And Darren greatly came to me at the perfect time, probably around a year ago, when I learned what oversharing was, when I learned <laughs> what, what the difference between shame and guilt were. Yeah. Game-changing moment in my life. That's a tipping point for me and my mindset to get over, oh, well, I do have self-worth because I'm, I'm not a bad person because of this right. reason. It's not my identity that's attached to the bad behavior one time. I can have guilt over it, right? but I don't need to have shame over it. And that's one of those things that, that really developed self-worth for me. Nice. About a year ago. So, I mean, I'm curious, actually, I know that, um, um, what were you, what have been your biggest breakthroughs since, since, uh, I don't know, two, three years that you've been working. I don't know if you, you've been, you've probably been asked about this in the podcast, but I'm curious. 
No, I, I love it. I love, I love that question because uh, discovering the Enneagram was a breakthrough number one. Mm -hmm. uh, picking up John Maxwell's Five Levels of Leadership okay. uh, was a personal and a professional breakthrough for me. Um, <laughs> beginning to understand that vulnerability is a strength and not a weakness. Mm -hmm that I don't have to have my walls up all the time and that I can allow people to get close to me as right. long as I still maintain the healthy boundaries that I've set for myself. Nice, man. What yeah. about in dating though, in, in dating specifically? <laughs> well, actually all of those all of it related to that, all of those relate to dating. Absolutely. Because, um, when we're oversharing maybe too much information in the first month of dating or the first couple months mm -hmm. of dating, and we forget that our life, our personal life and our experiences and our, our memories are like an onion. Yeah. And we just peel it one layer at a time as opposed to slicing it down the middle. <laughs> and then the end result is that the onion and the odor makes us cry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Right? So that's how oversharing helped me in dating is like, okay, what's appropriate to share mm -hmm. on date one or date 10 or date 30 or whatever? Um, what's appropriate to share on the podcast, but also discovering that being vulnerable is a strength. So I'll, I'll use an example of uh, sure. a, a recent first date. Um, I was sharing the story of, mm, you know, my daughter, my daughter is a really, really big piece of my life. Probably the most important thing in my life. And yeah. She got sick, so I was telling the story about she, how she was in the hospital for about 10 days, and I, I very rarely share her um, health with uh, people that I date. It's just not appropriate. And sure. on this first date, I brought it up because, you know, we had connected over my passion as a father, mm. and she asked me point blank, well, what was she sick with? And I did share that story at that time because... I took a moment to pause and think of like, is this appropriate at this time? Sure. And I took a chance and I took a risk at being vulnerable without the intention or the manipulation that can come from behind vulnerability right. and sharing right, right. and oversharing and things. And I took a leap of faith and I shared the real story and she thanked me for it afterwards. Huh. Even though it was hard, even yeah. though it was not something I normally do. I took a risk and showed to myself that vulnerability is a strength and not a weakness. Very nice. I like it, man. Yeah. So all of these tools and principles that I mentioned a little while ago, what were my turning points? Those all relate to my dating life and my social life and my, my personal life because it starts here with me. Yeah. Yeah if I don't have a good foundation of my values and my beliefs and my self-awareness, that doesn't translate to my dating life in a positive way. It actually like creates the downward spiral over and over and over again, or these, pa or these repeated patterns over and over and over again. That's uh, that's true. Yeah. Definitely been the case for me as well in the past. Good. I'm glad you asked that question. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I was curious about it. I'm also curious. I mean, what do most, what do you hear the most, most common questions or the most common struggles is it like how to go from dating into a relationship or what are the most common things that people struggle with in from your audience i think that the common is how do i find that person that i want to date yeah and my answer is um discover more about yourself because yeah. um i go to a men's group every other monday and it's been transformational for me. I've, I've interviewed the creator, Jeff Lawton, twice on the podcast now. And he's a nice. good, positive uh, mentor and uh, influence in my life. So each and every man in that room is a reflection of me in a different way. Oh, I love what I'm hearing, man. Seriously, I, I, I have something about that. Keep going. And if I'm aware of the reflection of like, oh, well, why did this conflict to come up with that person I need to reflect on it about me and sometimes it's the leader sometimes it's the the other personality type that's like my own in the room or sometimes it's um the situation contextually oh he's going through the same thing I am right now let me look into the mirror wow 
across the room and say, how do I become more self-aware and then turn it around? Uh, I love what I'm hearing. Yeah. And, and I love it because, um, first of all, you're, you're taking responsibility over your reality. Second of all, you're getting to know yourself through that reality. And for me, one of the biggest things, and I, I mentioned this before uh, was, we've been talking, um, is, uh, is dreams. They say you're everyone in your dream. You're a, everyone in your dream is a projection of you. No different on the outside. <laughs> for the most part, um, you, you are dealing, you are interacting, for the most part, I'm saying, for the, in general, most people are interacting with filters, with projections of how they think people are and so forth and so forth. And so they do become your greatest teachers because they are in a way an extension of you, an extension of your mind and that sort of thing. So I completely agree. I like how they, that came from in terms of awareness and taking responsibility for, for your reality, for sure. Yeah, I didn't know that that was going to be a result when I joined the group in January, December or January. Oh, really? Uh, it in combination with everything else that I do, all of my homework. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> my homework through the Enneagram or my homework through journaling. Um, it's just another piece of the puzzle. And all of these pieces individually would not add up to the personal growth and discovery that I've found in the last two years plus. Well, I think it would be powerful. You know, it would be powerful. I think for people listening, if you could share, you've probably already shared it. I'm sure in so many podcasts you've done, but what is your routine? What is your, your uh, empowerment besides you know the deadlifting and all the crazy <laughs> martial arts that you do what is your routine and i love to share mine because i think that's where the continuous self-discovery happens as well as transformation as well as creation so what what is your personal one uh thankfully i'm 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 having grace for myself in this transitional period of my life uh, i just started a new career a couple weeks ago so there's a transitional <laughs> period for me yeah. But the routine actually helps me get through that. Nice. Um, if I wake up 5 a.m. and I journal for one page, that's all my expectation is. Mm -hmm. If I journal one page and then I take the dog for a walk and then I get my things ready, my lunch and my gym bag ready for a 6 a.m. workout five sure. days a week. Nice. And then I take the hour 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. to get to work. And then I go through my work day, but I, I take an hour for lunch, you know, like I have to reset and divide my day up into halves. And then um, I either listen to a podcast on my way to work or on lunch or an audible book. I have two in the queue right now. Oh, wow. Um, Battlefield of the Mind. And then uh, what was the other book that I just downloaded? A male author. Um, I'll have to think of it in a second, but you know, yeah. I'll choose Audible or I'll choose a podcast. So my routine is all self-education. I get to choose what I'm learning right now. Wow. And then I'll, I'll cut out of work. And the first thing I do is I come home and I walk the dog and I'll eat dinner. And then I have jujitsu class in the evening or, or I go to a men's group on every other Monday and then a different group every other Wednesday. Thank wow. God they're on opposite weeks. <laughs> You're a machine, man. Uh, you know, it was hard in the beginning, but I didn't add all these pieces at once. Mm -hmm. It was like one at a time. Um, I Are joined you? the men's group. I asked them what kind of a journal should I start with? And they recommended the five minute journal. Mm. For me is the challenger with the intensity that I bring to everything that I do. Podcast, jujitsu, weightlifting, dating, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. Of course. The, five minute, the five minute journal was a little bit too um, structured for me. Is it just about your day, by the way, when you journal? You journal about Actually, your thoughts? Or? Uh, my day comes into it, but I begin yeah. with three um, sentences of gratitude. Mm. And uh, I'm grateful for a great night's sleep. I'm grateful yeah. for uh, the abundance I have in my financial life. I Man. actually started writing that gratitude before it actually happened. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I'm manifesting financial abundance by actually being grateful for it before it happens. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Uh, or I phrased it in like, I'm grateful for this opportunity for financial abundance. It's my job on a day-to-day -day basis to go out and get it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right? And then um, my nighttime routine after, after jujitsu is I refuel and then mm. I shower and then I 
um, for a long time, I was journaling at night too. And I, that's where I would write my, my lesson learned of the day. Mm, wow, man. It's awesome. And, and when I started journaling, that's when my dating life got better <laughs> because I, I took myself out of my head and I started with uh, three sentences of gratitude in the morning. So that had nothing to do with my dating life. Maybe, maybe it was grateful for a great night, but they, <laughs> a great date the night before. I don't know. But the lessons learned were like, um, oh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share that vulnerable moment. Yeah. Or I'm grateful that I actually didn't overshare <laughs> on that first or second date. You know, it was, it was like reframing what I was experiencing in my dating life to always be positive, even if I didn't go out with that person again and I wanted to. I'm like, yeah, I'm for the chance to learn from first or second or third date or whatever. And modify your reaction, your internal reaction, yeah. And then fix it for later on. I'm like, okay, well, I just won't do that again. However, here's the caveat to everything that I'm, that I'm bringing up. It sounds like I'm a, I'm a machine and it sounds like I'm so structured and so disciplined that there's no room for um, wavering whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And why I brought up that vulnerable moment of sharing my daughter's story and taking a chance and a risk on that first date that I was telling you about right. is this idea that I've come across a couple of times in my life where you can never say the right thing to the wrong person and you can't say the wrong thing to the right person. Yeah. So if I take a risk on a date and I would encourage people listening to take risks about what you choose to talk about first few dates in and this is not a test of the other person. This is simply a test of yourself of like, okay, can I waver from the norm to get different results? And that's really what it is. It's not even a risk. It's just wavering from the norm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm changing things up. I'm mixing things up because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Right. So all the times in the past when I forced dating situations or I forced myself to go out on a second and a third date when it just didn't feel authentic or natural. It right. came down to a point of like, I'm going to make a decision to just quit for a little while, take a break. And then all of a sudden, boom, there it happens. Right. You came back with a different awareness, different vibe, right? I did. And I took the time for myself to rebuild this foundational belief that I have that I am worthy. Yeah. I'm good enough. And even if I take a chance and a risk and, and share something vulnerable with the right person, yep. guess what? It is going to bring more authentic connection into the experience for both of us. Yeah, I agree. And, and also, I mean, that also has to do with your story. You're telling yourself that that's what's going to happen. So that response is more likely to be positive unless you're telling yourself that every time you're vulnerable, people uh, reject you <laughs> or something like that. So it's also the story that you're telling yourself about the action or the vulnerability that you're taking or the authenticity that you're being or the, uh, that kind of stuff. It's also the story behind it that it's going to not only impact how you share it, um, but also the result. But, but yeah, definitely it will impact how you share it as well. As opposed to a needy sharing or confident, abundant, this is how it is. And uh, it's, uh, it's a little, I feel a little nervous saying it, but you're, feeling good about yourself regardless type of thing. Yeah. That's the, that's really the definition of authenticity. Yeah. It's like sharing your story from a place of confidence, self-worth, comfort, and your audience will feel that as well. Whether that's Absolutely. one or an audience of 5,000 on social media. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No. And the reason I asked for the, um, as far as your routine goes, because I don't know, I, I think it's a differentiator between, um, definitely success on the, sh um, you know, short term, but also in the long run, it literally will reshape your life and everything. I mean, for me, same like you, um, I journal, I journal my dreams. I uh, go into meditation right after the journaling, um, my story in every single day. In fact, I do it, um, many times, twice or three times a day. And that is how I keep myself centered because I know a lot of people, feel like there's a lot of ups and downs in their days. The way to really remedy that is to 
begin to really uh, work out their, um, their mental muscles, if you will, their gratitude muscles, their confidence muscles, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the more you do it, the more, uh, the more the effect and the faster it happens as well in terms of creation. I 100% agree. Well, Felipe, yeah. bef before we um, take the time to jump or before we jump off the podcast, is, is there one thing that you want to leave us with that we didn't touch on today or that you would like to expand on a concept that we had maybe briefly touched on? Uh, the floor is yours to share with the audience um, what you want their big takeaway to be. I think it goes along with what you mentioned in regards to um, personal discovery and, and uh, introspection get to know yourself uh, fully, uh, whatever way that you use it. Uh, I mentioned the, the uh, dream journaling. I've done lucid dreaming in the past, dream yoga, uh, that kind of stuff, as well as journaling. When you really bring all that stuff out into the open, and I'm sure many people have shared this on your podcast, um, it, it works. A lot of the stuff will just begin to dissolve because, again, um, as you mentioned, the definition of insanity is doing something over and over, expecting a different result. The issue is that you're not aware of it. You're not aware that you're doing it, and you're not aware that crazy story that you have in your head, that, and emotions even, that are propelling that habit and those actions or that vibe every single time. So you think you are not projecting a weird vibe. You think you're not doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, but you are. So be aware of that. Really um, figure out resources to, to really go deep into your, um, to your subconscious, to different conditioning you've had, and uh, begin journaling, like uh, I think like you mentioned. But uh, I can't stress that, that enough. I think it's, the, uh, it's like marketing. Marketing becomes easy when you know your client, when you do research, all that kind of stuff. All the other stuff becomes easy. Just same with yourself. Do the research on yourself. Get to know yourself. And uh, you can open yourself up to uh, a lot of power, uh, self-empowerment, I would say. Completely agree. All right, Felipe, if somebody wants to get a hold of you and your message resonated with them today, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah, I actually have a, a free uh, video course on my website. It's uh, on www.social-buddha.com. And they can sign up for the free course uh, as well as my YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, I'd love to uh, share more of this, uh, you know, knowledge, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'll put all those in, all that information in the show notes in the blog post below. So uh, if Felipe's message resonated with you guys today, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I've truly enjoyed our conversation. Um, thanks for tuning in all the way from Spain and Croatia. Croatia. Where are you at today, actually? I'm in, uh, I'm in Spain right now. I'm visiting my brother, but I normally live in, in Croatia. Okay. Well, the next time that we connect and collaborate, I want to hear more about uh, living in Europe, what it's like to date in Europe. We have really a lot of listeners in Spain, actually. Oh, really? Wow. We, we do. Um, Spain really jumped on board a few months ago, and they just started loving the podcast and sharing it. And we couldn't be more appreciative of the reach that our community has for authentic daters. And um, wow. I'm, I'm super pumped to see how far it can go. Uh, to make a change and impact people's mental health around the, the world of authentic, authenticity, vulnerability, transparency, and dating and love. No, I think it's going to go very far. I mean, you're doing some amazing work, uh, Dave. So thanks for having me here. Uh, and I really have enjoyed it as well. It's, you're a great person, and I appreciate uh, just chatting with you. It's been fantastic.